so yeah, the Office of Navy Research, which is part of the Department of Defense, uh, has supported you know most of our our studies, most of my work, and now I, yeah. get, I get funding from uh, various uh, uh, industry partners. And, yeah, uh, and we patented a few things and get a little bit of funding from that, and which helps out a lot to support some of our undergrads. Uh, and Chris it may have showed you this. He did, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> This was kind of more or less like my postdoctoral fellowship project. <laughs> yeah. So I'll give you a short little sure. thing. So atomic force microscopy doesn't use light or electrons to image a sample. It uses a, a probe that can come down and physically touch the sample and then it scans back and forth. For example, on some, these are human uh, brain tumor cells. Yeah. And no light or electrons bouncing off anything were used to capture this image. It's actually the can the the probe tip will go back and forth and it will lightly touch it. Okay. And it creates a three dimensional image that's very high resolution, even much higher than what you could achieve with a light microscope. Because with light, the wavelength of light is like about two hundred nanometers and we can go we can go sub nanometer resolution yeah. with an atomic force microscope. Similar to a scanning electron microscope, but we can image living tissue with it. Yeah. So that makes it very unique. And so we can zoom in on physical damage to uh, oxidative damage to the membrane, which is caused by hyperbaric oxygen. And we discovered that uh, one of the publications that I had as a, as a postdoctoral fellow was that high oxygen damages cancer cells. Yeah. So at least in cell culture. So one of the motivation for uh, for doing a project for my first PhD student, who is uh, Angela Poff, who's now uh, gone on to be a research associate with her own grants, yeah. uh, was to test the application of the ketogenic diet combined with hyperbaric oxygen therapy in a mouse model of metastatic cancer. And that was her dissertation project that yeah. she presented. And, that sounds uh, fascinating. <laughs> about three or four articles on that. Yeah. So, so this thing right here <laughs> allows us and this head turns and, and this just closes and everything when we have it running and it's yeah. always like a project in in process <laughs> so we're yeah. always adapting different technologies to this uh, including I got an additional grant for a scanning oh. electron microscope oh. uh, or in a, a scanning uh, uh, confocal microscope that's what this is that I adapted to this that allows us to like image mitochondria yeah. under hyperbaric pressure so we wow. can do atomic force microscopy, and we can do scanning confocal microscopy. And we've published some of this. One of our first publications was in neuroscience on that. And, and this thing weighs 6,500 pounds, <laughs> uh, and we had to push it in there. Wow. <laughs> and this video, uh, it's, this video is like an hour or so long, but it, yeah. uh, some of the faculty at USF have to go fishing. <laughs> So yeah. this video, uh, and that's a big loop that I caught, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh, there's a video in there that shows us moving this uh, hyperbaric chamber, and we had to put it on like little skateboards and push it across yeah. the courtyard. I so, thought maybe uh, I'd... Uh, and this was immediately after that. <laughs> oh, wow. It was like on top of a, a big semi-truck, and this was facing forward, I remember, because these are all the bugs that were hitting it. Yeah. It was coming here. Wow. across the country and this is right right after moving it. <laughs> it was a little bit bigger at the time. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought maybe I just yeah. strapped it to your back. Oh, I got uh, it. <laughs> yeah, like a dozen people pushing it. Yeah. Uh, so this is like the control station. So we could do confocal microscopy and electron micro microscopy on here. And we also had, I don't know where it's at now, but we had an electrical stimulator uh, so we could stimulate the cells. Yeah. And this unit here basically controls all the gas tanks we have on the other side of the wall. We call that okay. the gas farm. Yeah. And then depending on what experiment we want to run, I could turn on the nitrogen, the oxygen, you know, specialty mixtures, and pressurize the chamber. Yeah. The helium even, and uh, and I could set the flow of the pressurization or the decompression based on based on some of the controls here. Wow. Uh, so my my postdoctoral mentor, PhD mentor, 
is also a historian for the American Physiology Society. Yeah. And he gives talks all over, like at Yale and, you know, Ivy League talks and give a great talk at IHMC on aviation history. Yeah. And um, if your listeners are interested, and it talks about kind of the evolution of uh, aviation medicine and, and doing this kind of research back in World War II and how advancing our understanding of high altitude medicine allowed us to win the war. So wow. it allowed us to develop yeah. pressurized cabins and understand the physiological limitations that allowed the planes. So if, if Germany and, and Japan were shooting bombs at us, they would get up about this high, about mm-hmm. 20,000 feet and go down. But by understanding the, the limitations of human physiology and then pressurized cabins, we were able to go beyond what they could shoot up. Yeah. So it was said early in the war, the planes that went higher and f- and farther could drop the bombs on the cities and win the war. That's yeah. What we did. So it yeah. was really a war of physiology. So uh-huh. a lot of people don't know that. But yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. Physiological limitations allowed us to, to win the war. And uh, my mentor is writing a, a book on that. Actually. Wow. So, uh, yeah. And he also worked on some of the art that was, he worked with it with an artist to figure out the different um, the different covers for Journal of Applied Physiology. What the? Uh, this is another instrument here. It allows us to do electrophysiology inside. And so we can record from the brain, yeah. <laughs> from brain cells, yeah. uh, and dive them to extreme levels of, uh, of depth. And you might want to even get a picture of that. I think yeah, I sure. could turn on the light inside here. Oh, sorry. So it might make it look pretty cool. Uh, you got light? Mm-hmm. Yep. No? Okay. Wow, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yep. And uh, this is essentially a manifold to all the tanks on the other side of the. Uh, on the other side of the wall here, in what yeah. we call the tank farm. And yeah. if you want to do, you know, use nitrogen, helium, air, uh, or oxygen too, we have uh, the capability to send any type of gas or mixtures of gas to the chamber and to the physiological solution that the brain slices in, that the, that the animal is breathing, or yeah. that the cells are exposed to. And this is this allows this equipment right here allows us to make specialty gas mixtures that are used for various technical diving. Yeah. So, yeah. Another chamber here. We do electrophysiology. Mm-hmm. You can see we basically build like a homemade microscope that goes inside there yeah. and because you can't, you know, off-the-shelf microscope won't, won't fit in there. So yeah. we need to engineer and build our own equipment to answer questions. And a lot of the questions that we were asked to, a- to answer, the technology wasn't available for us to answer it. So we had to first build the tool to answer the question. <laughs> my first two years or so, after I finished my PhD, was more tinkering and engineering things. Yeah. And I grew up on a farm playing with dirt bikes and go-karts. I like tinkering with things, so yeah. I enjoyed kind of uh, building things. Yeah. Getting them to work. So it was pretty fun to me. Did you, did you have help building this by engineers, or is it just something uh, you had to do? Yeah, we had, we would draft it out, uh, and it was a combination of kind of ideas, and if we needed an electrician to make a certain thing, or um, a certain widget, like we had various people that we would go to mm-hmm. to make that. Uh, it's like, here's what we need, and you know, we work with various, uh, I guess you'd call them, uh, not 
huge in years, but they had workshops, so they were usually older individuals that were very skilled in the art of fabrication. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they were machinists, I guess, in a way, but like machinists slash engineers slash electricians that were, you know, kind of had built a lot of things for aviation yeah. and, and for other, like, very technical aspects. Um, and here's another kind of, this is, this system right here is our radio telemetry system. And what we do is, uh, I think this might sh not this one. Uh, we have various things that show, oh, yeah. Um, so we have uh, a sensing module that we can implant inside the animal. And uh, this allows us to measure uh, heart rate, diaphragmatic, EMG, and then brain activity yeah. as far as the uh, EEG activity. And once that's implanted, the animal can recover and it allows us to, uh, to add a little battery pack associated with it. And we can stick them inside here and we can dive them to various depths that would um, be equivalent to uh, like high depth missions. Yeah. And then we can look at their resilience to those environmental extremes in the absence and presence of ketones and yeah. ketone formulas. And then we can look at all the physiological data sent there. We have a camera system up here to look at its activity. And of course we close this up. Not too pressure tight if that's open. <laughs> <laughs> we seal all this up, yeah. we pressurize it, we let them acclimate and calm down, and then we start we flow in the high levels of oxygen and then we pressurize it yeah. to simulate the depths. And we have a little chamber back here where we do hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So inside this chamber, we can stick up to a dozen mice, yeah. and then we can close it up, and sometimes we can also do cell cultures. We can put in there and dive cells and expose them to high levels of oxygen. And if we're giving mice hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we would our protocol would be like Monday, Wednesday, Friday for one hour, and we do 2.5 atmospheres of oxygen, which is 10 times the amount we're breathing now, right. essentially a little bit more than 10 times. And we do that three times a week for one hour in mice that are eating a ketogenic diet. So the idea being that the high levels of oxygen saturate the tumor with, with oxygen, a reverse tumor hypoxia, and it causes the tumor cells to overproduce oxygen free radicals, which can kill the tumor from the inside out. Wow. So, uh, and it can also, hyperbaric oxygen works through different ways. We're just starting to understand it can augment your immune system yeah. and activate various um, defenses in your immune system, could also be another way. So, this has been a really uh, important piece of equipment in our lab. And all the hyperbaric studies that we've done for hyperbaric oxygen treatment have been done in the solar chamber here. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of like just, we have another kind of lab across the hall, and it's more doing patch clamp electrophysiology and some other things. It's mostly uh, used by my uh, colleague, Dr. Dean. Yeah. But I think this is kind of gives a little snapshot into some of the, the environmental chambers I thought you might be interested in yeah. for military applications. Okay. So we use these technologies to, from, from my perspective, for the whole animal study, we can screen out what ketogenic agent at what dose is most effective. And some, would, and the, some of the other technologies that I showed you in entering the lab, that can allow us to mechanistically determine how these ketone therapies are working yeah. from the level of the membrane to the level of the mitochondria. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind yeah, of cool, yeah. That's it's a little bit easier said than done because these experiments are uh, can be kind of costly and yeah. time-consuming and, and tedious, but it's it's allowing us to slowly gain great insight into the problem itself. Yeah. And also by gaining insight into the problem, which is oxygen toxicity seizures, you have decompression sickness, also known as the bends. Mm -hmm. You have high pressure nervous syndrome. If you go really deep, you start to get the shakes. Yeah. If you saw James Cameron movie The Abyss, no. where they get uh, HPNS. Uh, yeah. So we can we have pressures that can get that high to study that. 
So we look into the fundamental cause of the problem, and then that allows us to kind of reverse engineer things to mitigate that specific problem yeah. in the signaling pathways that yeah. are impacting. Yeah. So, so that's a kind of a more of a broad overview of what we do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> yeah. When uh, you know, when I first came in, I. I was talking to Dr. Rogers about implications with like high altitude and all that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you do any of that. So we can do that too. So in addition to doing high pressure here, we have a system that we can pull a vacuum on that chamber yeah. and we can simulate the top of Mount Everest. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. we can go high pressure or that's called hyperbaric hypoxia. Yeah. Or we could go low pressure and that's called hypobaric. Right hypoxia, so lack of oxygen. So last year, or last week at this time, I was, right about this time, I was standing at 14,000 feet. Yeah. I was hypoxic. Yeah. <laughs> I was feeling it. Yeah. I think I was feeling it less because I was in ketosis. Right. So I think ketosis may help with that. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, at 14,000 feet, I was feeling it. And that goes beyond that. I think it goes to about 25,000 feet. Wow. Well, yeah. So, yeah, that's a little, that's my spiel for the... Uh, the <laughs> biomedical research lab, and that's what this is called. Yeah, it's one of the most interesting labs I've ever been in. Yeah. I used to do research here with Dr. Cameron. I don't know if he's still here I or not. That, yeah, I know. Um, I yeah. He did Sertoli cells and wound healing, but we were just, yes. it was just a bunch of, uh, you know, rats everywhere. And, yeah, and I'm, yeah. I wasn't incredibly fond of it. It was really interesting research, but it was, you know, this is really. 90% or more of the research that we do is actually over in the vivarium. Yeah. Where the animals are held. And yeah. And, uh, for, you know, reasons for animal care, so we don't need to help out, you know, people are filming there. Yeah. But most of my lab, I would say 95% of what we do is over there, and occasionally, you know, we bring animals here to test it. Oh, okay. But we do a lot of the, the research over there. Okay, yeah. 